Okay, Boker yeah. Tov, everybody. Shavua Tov, Chodesh Tov, Summer Tov. I hope everybody's doing well, and it's a, a, a pleasure. We're going to start a, a new series as we enter the month of July, July and August, the time for extra learning. People have more vacation time, so we hope more of you, you'll invite more of your friends to come and join us. A pleasure to welcome Rabbi Liebtag. We're going to go through basically till Elul, I believe, till August the 26th, uh, August 28th, the beginning of Elul. So we'll go, please go out this class till August 19th. Even on Tisha B'Av, where please God will have our uh, all day Tisha B'Av program, Rabbi Liptag will be giving the shear on the Haftarah of, your, of Tisha B'Av, which is from Sefer Yirmiyahu. Although I will summarize the class I mentioned last week. Um, do when politics and uh, religion collide. Uh, I think that's what is titled. So the simple answer is always, and therefore they should have nothing to do with each other. And that's the summary of the course. Religion and politics don't mix, but Rabbi Liebtag will explain that at much greater length over the next number of weeks as we go through Sefer Yirmiyahu. Okay, Rabbi, I hope okay, that okay. Was, wasn't too long an introduction for the first class. Okay, so look, you're almost a prophet here in my introduction. So you said as we enter the month of July and August, I said as we enter the month of Tammuz and Av. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, because, I'm, you see, that's because you live in Israel and I live in a, you yeah. know, in the, well, in the in America, Tammuz. Tammuz isn't such a Jewish name, but it's okay. Somehow, somehow it got into our calendar. Yeah, Tammuz yeah. Is, a sun, is a sun god in, uh, in other cultures. Okay. Um, anyway, because it's the middle of the summer. Anyway, um, that's actually in Yecheska where they, they're, they're worshiping the Tammuz god. In the <laughs> okay. Anyway, we'll get started. So we're starting a month of Tammuz and Av, and the three weeks, and all the after all. Um, so we're going to dedicate uh, the next two months, next day classes. Um, okay. Okay. Anyway, okay. Rabbi, and, I made you host, so you you have to mute. Okay. 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 I want to see. Yeah, yeah. Wait, uh, my transcription is on. Let me take it back. Okay. Um, but how do I turn it off for myself? I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it. And I'll do it. We have to do, you'll do a, a quick... And then um, I'll make you co-host. Okay, fine. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll know what to do. Okay. Maybe host and, and turn on mute and we'll start over again. Yeah. Okay. But uh, do you know, anyone know how we turn off the um, the um, live caption? Uh, it can be on for other people, but I want to turn it off for my for my own. When you're talking about the live transcription closed yeah. caption that's been enabled, I just think click the X. There, there should be an X next to it. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll share the source sheet in a minute. I don't see an X on it. Let me take a look. Um, I clicked on it. Anyone on the thing know how to turn off a, a caption? I, I, just, I don't get, yeah, I'm actually, my, the closed captioning isn't on on my end. I mean, usually people ask me and then I turn it on. For I, them. I, I, I okay it. Go, go I, to live transcript and, and turn off show subtitle. How do you go, a oh, live transcript, I see, okay. Hide subtitle. Okay, that's it. Okay, great. Okay, so now we're going to start. We can start the recording from here. But, um, so we're going to start. So let me go back and we'll start from scratch about the source sheet. I'm going to, um, it should be online, but I'm posting it again I'll here. I'll post it in a second too. I'll and I, I, there's a link to, um, I put a link there to the source sheet. Okay, and you can post it also uh, from my Google Drive. Okay. So let me turn this off. And OK, welcome, everybody, to our class. Um, and we are going to open our source sheet. Here we go. So as far as the title, when politics and religion clash, not collide, but clash, the, um, I'm going to do something almost opposite. What usually happens, we call it a rabbi speech, is when we take the Bible, we take the Torah, and we use it as a tool, to, as a springboard, to develop our political opinions or present our political opinions. What we're gonna do in this class is we're going to use our understanding of politics to understand the religious message of Yirmiyo. We're gonna do exactly the opposite. We're not gonna study Yirmiyo and try to drive a political message. We're gonna take our understanding of politics in modern day times and in ancient times as well, but the study of politics will help us understand what's special about Yirmiyo. So let me read my introduction and then we'll get to work. So we're entering the months of Tammuz and Av. We're gonna dedicate the next two months to an in-depth study of the book of Yirmiyahu for simple reason that you know, the three weeks is coming up. And um, ever since they published a hardcover keynotes book, that's it. You know, Kosh Baruch almost brought Mashiach, then someone published a hardcover keynote book. And God said, that's, uh, that's a lack of faith. And now we're gonna suffer for who knows how much longer. 
Um, so anyway, we're going to be reading these after all, uh, probably this year as well. Uh, and the premise of our study is that if you want to understand the later prophets, later prophets being the classic ones being Yirmiyahu, Yishayel, and Yechazkel, and the small, the 12 prophets afterwards, but unlike what we call Navim Rishonim, uh, what they call the early prophets, those are more, um, they read more like history, they're prophetic history, but they're not a collection of the works of one prophet. The book of Shmuel is not a collection of the prophecies of Shmuel, but rather it's events that happen during the lifetime of Shmuel that relate primarily to King David and, and the beginning of the kingdom. But the, the what we call Nevi Machronim, what they translate in English as later prophets, um, what ties them all together, it's a collection of sermons or prophecies of specific Nevim. It, we don't begin with their history when they were born, you know, when they finished Shas and things like that. It's simply a collection. How they're presented, in what order, that's an interesting topic, especially in, in the book of Yirmiyahu. But it's a collection of prophecies. I'm going to give you an analogy to appreciate what we're going to do. So my whole premise is that if you want to study the books of the later prophets, you have to consider the time period, knowing its historical setting and prophetic setting. Meaning if I don't know what's happening historically in Jewish history at the time, or the prophetic background to the books, it'd be very hard to appreciate what we're learning. Otherwise, all the Nevim are saying the same thing, you know, do tshuva, and um, God will save you. If you keep on your bad ways, God will punish you. Almost every Navi says that idea. What's specific and special about each Navi? We have to understand the time period. So I'm going to give an example from a, a story I make up. Let's say there's a show in Washington, D.C. And let's say they were, you know, doing renovations. And they, in the renovations, they find an old Geniza. And the rabbi back in the 1860s, let's say, um, had this habit of writing down his sermons, either before or after Shabbos. And they found a collection of rabbi sermons from 1862 to 1865. Okay? Now, no, so let's say I found that book, that collection of the rabbi sermons in Washington, D.C. in the 1860s. Why would that be of so much interest to any historian? It was what would make it special for those who not, during the Civil War. War. It's during the Civil War. Now, I could read those sermons, and the people listening to the sermon know the Civil War is going on. One second. Um, let me do, do a. Uh, you want to get the the? Um... I did it already. I okay. Did. Okay. Okay. Fine. Um, the 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 people in Shul listening to that sermon is assuming the audience knows there's a civil war going on. Now, if, you, if you're not aware of the civil war, it would be hard to understand the message of the sermon. But the, in the rabbi's speech, he doesn't begin with a review of current events. He's assuming the people in Shul know the current events, and he's giving his insights, be it on slavery, whatever, written on the war, whatever his opinions might be. But you couldn't appreciate the documents that you're reading, the, the sermons that you're reading, if you don't know what's happening in American history at the same time period. So that's why I'm going to use that example for, for Yirmiyo. If you want to understand what Yirmiyo's message is, what his prophecies are, we need to know the time period and what's going on. Okay. Now, to prove that, the opening lines of the book of Yirmiyo, which about, uh, we'll begin with, Divir Yirmiyo ben Chakiel, he's a Kohen, um, which would surprise us that a Navi is also that a Kohen becomes a Navi, because Kohenim will dedicate their, their main career, not to bring sacrifices, but to teaching Torah and leading the people and guiding them and how to serve God. So he's a coin from the city of Anatot, which, which is a little north of Yerushalayim, in the land of Benjamin. Uh, we know exactly where it is today. Anata is right next to Pisgat Ze'ev, a little north of Yerushalayim, right where the, at the, almost towards the end of the light rail, if you've been to Yerushalayim, is Anata right next to Pisgat Ze'ev. Um, now, Asher Yad Var Hashem Elabi Mei Yoshiel Ben Amon Melech Yehuda, Asher Sei Shana Lamacho, most of our share will deal with that year. In other words, Yirmiyahu's career as a prophet begins during the reign of King Josea, Yoshiel from now on, um, in the 13th year of his reign. Why not the first year of his reign? We'll see why. But on the 13th year of Yoshiel's reign, something major is about to happen. And Yirmiyahu begins his career at that time. That's critical to understanding his, his book. Not only do, did he prophesy, prophe uh, give prophecy in the time of Yoshiel, also during Bimei Yehoiakim ben Yoshiel, Yoshiel had a son named Yehoiakim, who was not as good as Yoshiel. Also during the reign of uh, Yoakim's brother, Tzitkiel. Yoshiel had several sons. Several of them became king. But, um, but the main career of Yirmiyahu is during Yoshiel's reign. 
his son Yehoyakim and his other son Sidkiel until the time of the, of the exile. Now, if you ask most people, what makes Yermiel famous? Almost everyone's heard of Yermiel the Navi. They're all going to say he's the Navi who predicted the, uh, the Khorban. He predicted the destruction of the first temple. And if you look, if you read the book, we'll see, his whole goal was not to predict its destruction. His whole goal was to prevent the destruction. Unfortunately, he failed. But what makes him great wasn't that he had the vision and saw, you know, what makes him great is not the fact that he sees the future and his predictions come true. The, the job of the Navi is not to predict history, but to shape history. But there'll be a certain of Yermiel, which relates to the 70 years, which I'm sure you've heard of, which is going to be unique to prophecy in general, which will be key to understanding the book. I doubt we'll get there this week. We'll get there next week, hopefully. Today, we need to get the background of, um, of what's Yermiel's main message. So the first thing we need to do is understand what's happening in year 13 of King Yoshiel. Now, some people are familiar with their Jewish history, some people less. I'll try to find the middle road. But the first temple period lasts about 420 years. It starts with King Solomon uh, after King Shlomo. After Shlomo Melech, there's a split kingdom, which lasts about 300 and some years and uh, close, closer to 400. And then uh, towards the end of the first temple period, the northern tribes under Hoshea ben Elah, they go, they're exiled by the Assyrians. And for the last 40 some years of the monarchy, only we have the, the, um, the monarchy of, of, of Judah, of Yehuda, the 10 tribes are already in exile by the Assyrians. There's another 40 years before the temple is finally destroyed and everyone goes into exile. That, that detail is gonna be really important to understand the Amiel as we'll see soon. So, we're going to read um, the story of Yoshiel in chapter 34 in the book of Deuteronomy. I mean, you'll see why. We're going to go back and see its context, but just, just I want to understand first what's special about year 13 of Yoshiel. Plus like Aleph, and again, this is chapter 34 in the book of Deuteronomy. Ben Shmona Shanim Yoshiel B'macho. Yoshiel became king when he was eight years old, and he reigned for 31 years. Now, why is he king so young? Well, in case you know your history, his father died young. Actually, didn't die young. His father was assassinated. Can you believe a political assassination in Jewish history? So his father, King Amon, was assassinated. Uh, why he was assassinated, we'll see soon. And because he was assassinated only after two years of reign, after his grandfather, Menashe, was king for some 50 years. So Yoshio was very young, and therefore he became king when he was eight which means he wasn't king, he was a technically king, but who's running the country? The advisors of his father, of the cabinet of his father who was assassinated, uh, they killed the assassins and they took over. And when he became king, Yoshio was basically a puppet king who's only eight years old. But unlike his father and grandfather, he was actually a good king. He went straight in the eyes of God. He went in the ways of King David. You know, he was someone that he gets a uh, an altar set from Malachim. The kings usually get a report card. An A plus is being like David. A, a, a minus or a failure is going to be is being like Yeruvah ben Nevat, Asher Echtit Yisrael. But either either you do Hatob Hayashar ben Yashem or Hara ben Yashem. So he gets Hayashar, and like David, it's almost like an A plus. Now, um, what's the criteria for getting such a good grade? We're going to see soon. Actually. Um, in the book of Malachim in general, anyone who does a good job in building up Yushalayim in the temple gets an A+. That's David and Shlomo. Anyone who leads to, um, for sure, idol worship is bad, but even Bamot is going to get an A- minus or a, or, a, or a failure. Now, he began his reign in year 13. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He was eight years old when he became king. And that's the first year of his reign. Now he's 16. Okay, he's in high school now. He's 16 years old. He's still a teenager. Like we know, age 16, turn around in life, and he decides to become, he begins, he begins a turnover and be, turns religious as a teenager. He went to a good yeshiva high school. Maybe he went to Camp Stone or something for a summer program and got uh, whatever happened. And he got a, uh, he, he started going in the right direction. Four years later, after four years of, uh, of good education, we're going to see when he became king, 
Jerusalem was full of idol worship. We were really bad. Things were really bad as far as worshiping God. Ammon was a bad king, and when he became king, his advisors continued the policy. Yoshio turns around 180 degrees the policy of his father and the previous kingdoms and begins to get rid of and cleanse all of Yerushalayim from um, all the high places and all the idol worship. And boy, does he cleanse Yerushalayim. By Natsum Lefanav and Mizbechot Tabalim. Remember when we, um, they basically, they broke down all the altars to the other gods, to the Baal God. And we can, we can um, skip the whole list. Basically, he gets rid of the Asherim. Basically, he wipes out all idol worship. Um, and on top of that, he takes the, the bones of the Kohanim and burns them on their altars. By Taheret Yudav at Yushalayim. He cleanses Yushalayim and Yehudah from idol worship. Now, there's an important detail here. Uvarei menashe ve'efrayim v'shimon. Ad naftali b'charvotehem saviv. Not only did he do his purge in Yehuda, also in the cities of Menashe and Ephraim, that's the Shomron. In Shimon, we're not sure what that is, but we're not sure what Shimon went away, where he was settled because Shimon's over the place. All the way to Naftali, that's up in Svat. That's in the Galilee, okay? In their destruction. Why is that strange? 20 years earlier, the Assyrians exiled the northern tribes. What do we see? In the reign of Yoshiel, Israel is returned to control of the Shomron and the north. Now that detail will be important. What's that mean? The Assyrian conquest is over and the Babylonian conquest hasn't begun yet. There's, there's going to be an historic, this is the beginning of the historic background. Early in the reign of Yoshiel, there's a political opportunity where the Assyrian Empire is crumbling, falling apart. The Babylonians haven't come into power yet. There's a vacuum in the greater Middle East, and Yoshiel is able to grow leaps and bounds and expands, expands from Yehuda to the north and takes over the Shomron and even the Galilee. And he goes all over the places, getting rid of all the places of idol worship, then all Eretz Yisrael, and returns to Yerushalayim. Okay. Now, in the 18th year of his reign, that's six years after he begins his... Um, his cleansing of the land, remember? Not just Yerushalayim, also the whole land of Israel. This is an important detail. In the middle of cleansing Yerushalayim, first they get rid of the idol worship, now it's time to renovate the temple. There was, the temple was in use, but it's time to do renovations. Now we're going to see soon his grandfather, Menashe, basically basically destroyed the temple on his own. But they're going to fix up the temple, do a lot of renovations, have to get, get rid of all the idol worship that was there before. And in the middle of the renovations, they're going to find the Sefer Torah. I'm assuming it's a story you know of. We're going to read about it later in detail. But the big event in Yoshiel's career is when they find the Sefer Torah, and that's going to be a turning, like a, a, um, a tipping point in Jewish history. They're going to enter a new covenant with God, and they're going to hope that uh, we're going to call this Rishit Smichat Gulotenu. The hope is in year 18 of Yoshio is going to be the beginning of our redemption. And I'm explaining the rest of the show. I'm going to explain why I'm going to call Yimiel's time period, the beginning of his career. I'm going to call it the first Rishit Smichat Gulotenu. I'm taking, I'm paraphrasing from what we say in our Mishibarach uh, for the Medina. We call the state of Israel the beginning of our redemption. It's not the first time in Jewish history where things were really bad and we're giving, we're having a new start. And we're going to paint a picture now of Yirmiel's career in the beginning, where there's a great opportunity for the Jewish people to grow again. I'm going to call it the beginning of the Second Temple period, wait, before the First Temple was destroyed. But what I'm explaining is, in the eyes of the people of Yirmiel in the beginning, is that they see the First Temple period being over with the Assyrian conquest and the Ten Tribes going into exile. And we'll see with um, Manasseh, the king, we'll see soon went into exile. And Yoshiel is the beginning of what I'm going to call the beginning of the Second Temple period, again, before the Second Temple period, what they thought was the Second Temple period. It turns out being the end of the first, but they thought it was the beginning of the second. We're going to return to the story of when they find the Sefer Torah and what's, what they're going to do with it. But when they find the Sefer Torah, it's almost incidental. because It's part of, a, it's part of cleaning up the temple. It's part of a restoration project. No. Um, to understand the background to all this, we have to go to Sefer Melachim and see the background. But just going back, what are we seeing? Yoshiel's reform began in year 12 of his reign. Got it? 
again, when he was when he was 20 years old, right, which is 12 years into his reign, right, he began to cleanse the, the temple. And that's just the Judah and Jerusalem, the whole land of Israel. When did Yirmiel begin his career? In year 13 of Yoshio. That's too, that can't be by chance. What's that mean? It means if I'm asking myself, who is the prophet who's behind the religious reform of Yoshio? And history book is called the Josiah Reform. There's a great reform that Yoshio does. It doesn't only begin in year 18 of his reign. It begins in year 13 of his reign. That coincides with Yirmiel's career. So whatever, whatever you find Yoshio doing, Yirmiyo, the prophet, must be behind it. And we're going to see Yirmiyo and Yoshio are working together. And Yirmiyo's career begins with a great revival of Judaism, which is important to understand the background to his career and why a, a Navi, who was once the most popular and greatest Navi, all of a sudden becomes everyone's greatest enemy. Now, to appreciate why I'm calling this time period Rishit Smichat Galatein, the beginning of our redemption, we have to go back about 40, 50 years and see what happened to his grandfather. Now, um, just a quick review. But I'm purposely not going to years 500 BC, 800 BC, whatever, that was just confused people. I just want to talk about the, the Assyrian time period. The Assyrians um, were the biggest and the first major superpower um, from 700 BCE, from 750, even earlier, from the what's called the 8th century BCE, I think it's called. Um, we have uh, Sargon, even before him. We have Tiglat Pileser. Go to the British Museum, you see, you see their statues and everything left behind. Um, and we and the famous Saint Cheriv, the one who um, you know exiled the ten tribes and took over, almost took over Yerushalayim. All the, the Assyrian um, Empire took over Yudan and the ten tribes uh, during the reign of Chizkiel. Chizkiel was saved at the last minute, and Chizkiel's son Menashe pretty much gave in to the Assyrians. We'll read the story about it soon. Um, and the Assyrian Empire is controlling the whole Middle East, and we're under their jurisdiction, basically, under their control for over 100 some years. The Assyrian Empire is crumbling when Yoshev comes into power. And that background is going to be key, as we're going to see to understand what's happening. So we're going to pick up now. We're going to, we're going to jump now to... Um, the story of Menashe. Again, Menashe is Yoshiel's grandfather. Chizkiel was a good king. Um, and his son Menashe went bad. Okay. He was only 12 when he became king. He was king for some 55 years. His mother's name was Chapsiba. Okay. He would do the evil in the eyes of God. He's going to get the worst report card ever. And what he's doing is worse than the nations that got kicked out. Now, before I go any farther, let me just read something for you. I'm going to just open up my Tanakh for a second. I should have put it on the source sheet. I just realized I didn't. I want to open up Sefer Vayikra. There we are. I'm going to open up Sefer Vayikra, chapter 18, which we read on Yom Kippur at Mincha. It's right before Kedoshim to you, which is chapter 19. In chapter 18, it begins with, um, you know, don't act like the Egyptians, don't like the Canaanites, don't follow their culture, follow my laws. If we talk about the Arayot. And finally, towards the end, this is chapter 18 in the book of Baikra. After having all the Arayot, it says as follows, don't defile yourself with this type of behavior, because that's what the other nations did. And the land became defiled, and I, it's punished it for their sins. And therefore, God says as follows, you keep my laws. Don't do the abominations of the other You're nations. not screen sharing. I'm not screen sharing, am I? Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Sorry about that. Now we're screen sharing, okay? Chapter 18 in the book of Baikara. Okay. God reminds the people, don't act like the Egyptians, don't like the Canaanites, don't follow their culture, follow my culture and my laws. And a list of bad things that they did. It says, don't defile the land like they did. You keep my laws. Because these toy vote that I'm telling, forbidding you to do, that's what they did. And the land became defiled. And listen carefully. Don't let the land spit you out. If you defile it, like, it's, like it spit them out when they defiled it. Because whoever does this type of behavior in this land will be cut off. 
And if you don't, if you want to prevent exile, if you want to stay in your land, your behavior better be good. So I'm going to go back now to this phrase. In fact, if you remember Bipen of Tarim, God tells Abram, I can't give you the land of Israel. I can't allow you to conquer it until the Emirates have sinned and I can throw them out. So let's go back now to our source sheet. We're back now in chapter 21 in the book of Malachim Bet. Right? He does all these bad things, but they're as bad as the nations who got throughout uh, for us. And what does he do? He puts high places. The ones that Chizkiel, his, his father, got rid of. He made Bispachot to Baal, all the classic idol worship of the Canaanite gods. Asherah, remember the rain god, the fertility god, just like Ahab did, together with these other. Bow down to the whole gods of the heavens. Okay? He built Mizbechot in God's house. Okay? The house which is supposed to be associated with God's reputation, with God's name. He defiled it and made names for other gods in God's house. He was like, we'll see in a minute what's called the Hakis. He was super angry with God. Okay? Um, no, he, he did um, what's called Molech. He, turned, he put his sons in fire. He did basically every idol worship practice they did. They put idols, mamash, in God's house itself, not just outside Yerushalayim. He put a Pesot Asherah in God's house. This is a house dedicated to God's reputation, God's name. In that same house, he puts, you know, pure idol worship. Okay? And then he reminds that my promise that I won't, I'll keep you in line is the only condition to keep my laws. Here. Summarizing, Amiso didn't listen. Menashe misled them, led us astray, and we are worse than the nations that got through us out for, on, on their sake. God warned us with all Nevim, and he says as follows The worse than the Emirates that were here beforehand. And he caused all the people of Judah to sin, and now comes the punishment. Listen carefully. There's going to be a terrible thing happening to Yerushalayim. We'll call this Chorban. It'll be destruction. And anyone, when they hear the noise of this destruction, his ears, ears are going to uh, tingle or ring. Anyone know where we have the same phrase? The first Nebuah that Shmuel gets. Right? When Eli, remember, he was sleeping in the Mishkan by Eli, about the destruction of Shiloh and the house of Eli and the fall of Shiloh at the end of the um, period of the Shoftim, the, the prophecy of the destruction of Shiloh has the exact same introduction. And again, that was because of the corruption of the, of the, of the priest at the time. And therefore, God's saying the same thing that happened to Yerushalayim, that is going to happen, the same thing that Yerushalayim happened to Yerushalayim, and more than that. The same punishment the ten tribes got. Shomron was destroyed several decades earlier. The same fate will happen to Yerushalayim. I'm going to wipe Yerushalayim off the map, just like you wipe off dirt off the, off the plate. I'm going to abandon the remainder of my Nahala. That was the ten tribes are gone now. Yerushalayim's Judah is going to be gone as well. I'm going to let them fall in the hands of their enemies. I'm not going to protect them again. And they'll be a laughing stock to all their nations, to all their enemies. Why? Remember, they got, got angry. That's just a one time offense. This is cumulative. Ever since they left Egypt, remember, the, God was angry with the people. We had some good times. But looking at the big picture, ever since we left Egypt some 800 years earlier, all through the time of the Shoptim and the first temple period, we're consistently getting God angry. God says, I've had it. You need to go into rehab. Remember, I'm saying we have to need to go into rehab, but not game over. That's going to be one of Yemriel's big messages. Okay. In this, uh, Menashe um, spilled a lot of innocent blood in Yerushalayim. Now, if you ask anybody, let me stop the screen share for a minute. Ask anybody, what was the reason why the first temple was destroyed? Someone, you can say the answer right in the chat. What's the classic yeah. reason everyone quotes the Gemara Nyoma? Remember the second temple was Sinat Chinam? What was the reason for the first temple being destroyed? Avodah Zarah. Yeah, we, we call the big three, exactly. Yeah. The first Beit HaMikdash was the big three. It's the Gemara Nyoma, I mean, Yod Aleph on the bed. What was it? It was Avodah Zarah, idol worship, Shvichu Damim, and Arayot. Remember? Now, what did we just see 
And all the Pesukim the Gemara quotes are from the time of Menashe and from the Navi Yishayel. Got it? It's a terrible misunderstanding that caused people not to understand your meal properly. What I want to explain is, is that according to Chazal, the, the fall of the first temple period begins with Menashe. Because in the time of Menashe, it's crystal clear. We have Toivot, which are Arayot. Remember, you have Arayot for sure, because it's called Toivot, and it's quoting the Pesukim from Vayikra, which read Arayot. We have Avadazara, what do we have Avadazara we read? And we have Shri Chutamim. And they quote all these Pesukim. This is 100 years before the first temple is destroyed. This is 100 years before Nebuchadnezzar. It's before the Babylonians become a superpower even. And the Khurban Abayat Rishon is during the time of Menashe. And that's my key opening point. Now, if the base, if, if the destruction of the first temple period is during the time of Menashe by the Assyrians, because they destroyed the 10 tribes during the time of Chizkiel, Chizkiel was saved at the last minute, but it didn't last very long. Menashe's son goes astray. We'll see in a minute the king's going to go into exile. Uh, we'll see in a minute. And now that is king going to go into exile. Um, Menashe himself destroyed the temple, didn't he? We just read about it. The temple is destroyed not by a foreign enemy, but by our own king. It becomes a place of idol worship. Okay. Um, the, um, so what I'm trying to explain is, in the eyes of the people, the time period of Menashe, when the king goes into exile, we'll see, in, into, Babel, into, um, into a Syrian exile, and the temple is destroyed by our own king, and there's tons of idol worship. Basically, in, it's only like the end of the Assyrian conquest, and the 10 tribes are gone, and now Judah's pretty much, pretty much gone. And most of your shine is destroyed, and the cities of Yudah are destroyed already. That's the end of Bayat Rishon. And therefore, the recovery during the reign of Yoshiel, people are going to view it as the beginning of the Second Temple period. Hope that's clear. I'm going to show you on, on a graph in a minute. I'll graph it for you. Now, um, let me show you what happened now with the rest of Menashe. And, I mean, what happened afterwards. Okay. Um, okay. And Amon the center took over. Amon was 20, 22 years old when he became king. He reigned for only two years, and he did evil, and he went in the ways of his father, uh, the bad years of Menashe. He left God, and there's a, a uh, conspiracy against them, and he's assassinated, and the people go and assassinate the assassins and kill the assassins, and they make uh, Yoshio king. Got it? Amon, his son, as bad as his father, probably even worse. He's assassinated, and they kill the assassins, and they make Yoshio king, but the people running the government under Amon continue running the country when Yoshio, when he's eight years old, becomes king. Now, I need to read. Um, again, I probably should have put this in the source sheet. We have to go now back to Divar Yamim in our English Hebrew Tanakh and see the story of Menashe. It's almost identical in Divar Yamim, the first half. The second half is quite different. There we are, Chronicles 2. I uh, hope you see Chronicles chapter 34. The same story, um, I'm sorry, we have to go back to chapter 33. That's Yoshio, chapter 33. Yeah. Menashe, the same story in the beginning. And um, with the same Zardin of Korban. And then it says as follows. God spoke to Menashe and his people, they didn't listen. We're in chapter 33 in the book of Tibremim. Be'evei Hashem aleim et sariyat sabah asher l'melech ashor. Ba'yikudu et Menashe b'chokhim. See that? The Assyrians came to Jerusalem, captured the city. They took Menashe captive, put him in, in um, and bound him with, um, what's up, with, you know, in shackles, wherever they put him in. And they exiled him towards Babylonia, which later, which is Ashur at the time. It's not Babel yet, but it's the area where we call later Babel. But the Assyrians come, take over the city and exile the king. And the wording is the same as we see later on when they when they take Tzitkel into, into exile, or when they take um, Yochin into exile. Very similar wording. Now, in exile, in Ashur, Uchatzer Lochila, when he was really in trouble towards the end of his um, captivity there, he turned to God. Menashe does tshuva in exile. And God brings it back to Yerushalayim, and he does a little bit better. He fixes up part of the wall. You see, actually, if you go to Yerdavid today, um, they found the, the the wall of the city that he added um, to the west of Gihon. If you go to the um, the um, Yerdavid, 
excavations, walk through that they discovered about five years ago. And now you can walk through it. It's amazing what they built. He built up Yushan afterwards, but um, he got rid of some idol worship, but didn't do full tshuva. Okay. Uh, that's what the Gemara and Avodah Zara, when they talk, I mean, the Gemara in St. Henry talks about who has a uh, part in the world to come. Does Menashe have yes or no? So the Gemara brings up this possibility that maybe he did tshuva and maybe he does have some, some worthiness. Um, here. But yet to debray Menashe with Fiotro Elav, there's the rest of his history and how we daven and how he's warned and how they spoke in the name of God, you can read in, in the history books of Israel. Okay? Uh, and then Menashe dies, and then the son Amon takes over again, and um, he gets killed, and, and Yoshio takes over. Now, why is this important? Let me go back. What do we see? My claim is, in the eyes of the prophets, Menashe was rock bottom. Our king went into exile. The temple was destroyed, again, by, our, by ourselves. Idol worship, punishment, Assyrians take over. The 10 tribes are gone. Most of you does gone. Yushim is taken over. And you could see that as the end. Remember the, the prophet Isaiah, Yishayel, who was under his, who prophesied under the reign of Hiskel. In fact, I'll say that Menashe killed the prophet Isaiah. He now we talked about destruction. He also talked about renewal, all the prophecies of, of revival by Yishayel. So it could be that. The hopes of Yishayel of redemption, the people are hoping are happening during the time of, of Yirmiyel, what I, what, Yirmiyel and Yoshiel. What I want to claim now, I'm going to show you on a timeline now in a minute. I'll share a different screen. I hope that was, um, should have been on the source sheets also. I have a little graph here. I call it a sine wave. You'll see why. Hope everyone can see this. Let me make it nice and clear. Make it a little bit bigger. Okay. I'm going to use this to summarize what we've done and try to give an uh, analysis of what's happening. Let me explain this wave, the sine wave. The sine wave goes like this. And the sine wave goes in. Let me get the uh, arrows. Okay, We're going in this direction. Okay, The x-axis, that's going to be time from left to right. We start in the time of the judges, ending with the destruction of the first temple. The y-axis... That's going to be the state of the union. Listen carefully. What I'm measuring here is not, let me get a different color. I'll make it orange. Okay. What we're measuring here, just like the highest level during the time of Shalom Melech, is not how religious we are, but what's the state of the nation? How is our economy? How are our borders? How is our security? How are we rating as a nation? The best we ever had it was during King Solomon's time period. Why? We were united as a kingdom. Other nations looked up to us. We had no war. People wanted to marry us. People made business with us. Um, we took over the Gulf of Aqaba. We were importing. Uh, we had ships going down to Ophira, down into Africa. We were bringing in gold. We were controlling the Mediterranean basin. We were up in Syria. We, we, um, we were almost a superpower during the time of, of Shlomo Melech, and we were also religious at the time. Towards the end of his reign, things went bad. But during the good years of Shlomo Melech, end of David, early Shlomo, things had never been better. Everything falls apart with the split kingdom, with the rebellion of, of, of Yeruvam. Okay, why it happened, that's the topic for Sefer Melachim. Rock bottom is when we have a split kingdom, where there's civil war, war with our enemies. In other words, when the state of the union is bad, we're all the way down here at the bottom, that's like close to zero, and this is one. What if I call it zero to one? Things take like rock bottom. And one of the worst times in Jewish history, there's a terrible civil war between Aviyah and Yerovam, where half a million casualties in the battle. Um, and there's a later war between Asa and Basha, a state of war. Things are really bad for the next 50 years. They only recover and get better again when Yoshaphat, the king of Yudah, and Achav, the king of Israel, make a treaty and work together. There's unity, and the country grows great. The problem is they're full of Achav as tons of idol worship. Eliel comes at this time period and tries to fix things. And that's the story of Eliel and later of Elisha. Um, there's a revolt by Yehu, who takes rid of the house of Ahab. Things get bad again. Again, another civil war in a split kingdom. And things get better again at the time of Uziel and Yerobam, when the two kings get along. Or basically, when the kingdoms are united, the economy is great. When the kingdoms are, are fighting with each other, everything falls apart. Now, um, Things, get, things are great during the reign of Uziel. We're wealthy, we're great, things are awesome. 
things start going bad under Yotam, Yoash, and under Chizkel, the his rock bottom again, because that's when the Assyrians come and take over. I'll explain the Assyrians in a minute. Uh, if I look here on these boxes on top over here, uh, let me go back to a, let me clear this and pick a different color. There we go. And we want an arrow. Okay. If I look at these boxes, the Plishtim, the Egyptians, Aram, Ashur, Bavel, these are the superpowers. Got it? Now, watch what's happening. If I'm analyzing the ups and downs of Jewish history, got it? That these are when things are good, things are bad. I can come up with a very logical political theory. When are things good? Or better say, when are things bad? When there's a superpower giving us trouble. And when Egypt became a superpower, um, they came and basically knocked out um, Rehavam, took over most of Yudan and the 10 tribes. When Egypt became weak, we filled in the vacuum. Aram became strong, things got bad. Aram became weak, we become strong again. Ashur becomes strong, things go bad. Ashur becomes weak, we get stronger again. Bavel becomes strong, and things go bad again. So basically, if you want to stay in a good position in the Middle East, what do you need to do? You need to pick who's going to be the next superpower and be on their side. You see, you know, pick, pick what side to be on. Follow, follow Egypt, follow Ashur, follow Babylonia. But if you want things to be good, stay on the team of the superpower. Or when there is no superpower, try to fill the vacuum. But it has nothing to do with our religious behavior. What a prophet would like to see, a prophet would like to see a correlation, a direct correlation between the state of the union and how good and bad things are. In other words, this should be when we're religious. If I make it, um, you know, it's high point should be when we're following God and low point should be when we're not following God. The problem is we have high points when we're not so religious. And that's the Nevim have to explain. The Nevim have to explain why is it going to be during Ashur, why is Ashur so strong? Why does Ashur wipe out the 10 tribes? Because there's not so much idol worship in the time of Uziel and Yerobam. No, nothing as bad as it was in the time of Bachav. And Chizkel does great shuva. But things recover a little bit, but not enough. And Chizkel suffers terribly. In fact, the 10 tribes are destroyed during the reign of Chizkel. And most of the cities of Judah are destroyed during the reign of Chizkel. Lachish is destroyed. It's like all the big cities, except for Yerushalayim, was saved at the last minute. So a Navi has to explain why is it that, that a superpower is strong and defeats us even though we're not so bad. Now, if the only meta, if the only thing we're measuring is idol worship, then it doesn't make sense. During this time period, starting with Uzel and Yerobam, right over here, will be critical. Why? Because it's going to be one of the first times what we're doing well religiously, but we become wealthy, but we become affluent, and our society becomes corrupt. And right here, if you look at the bottom here, let me show you. At the bottom, we have the prophets. So Shmuel is a prophet during the time of David and starting the kingdom of uh, Shalom and David at the end of the Shoftim. Natan is a prophet by David and Shlomo. Achia Shiloni is a prophet with the split kingdom. Eliel is a prophet with Ahav and Yoshafat and Elisha under Yehu. But all of a sudden, there's a plethora of prophets from the time of Uziel and Yerobam. Hoshea, Yishayel, Amos, Bichah, the famous ones. And these are all what they call the ethical prophets. And what's happening here, basically, is things are going really bad in Jewish history, even though we're not so bad as far as idol worship goes. And the prophets have to explain to the people, why is it that Ashur is being so successful, even though we're so religious? And they come with this message that God doesn't only care about Karbono, he cares about social justice and things like that. But again, that's a topic for Hosea, Yishael, and Moshe Micha when you read them. What's important for us is that when Ashur comes in and becomes a superpower, I'm, I'm making a big deal about this. Let me change the color here. Um, let me make a new line. I'll make a red line here. I'm going to draw a line here with, with Galut Shamron. I want to call this red line the end of the first temple period. Or I, maybe I'll even move it over to here. I'm going to let me, let me change it. I want to draw a line over here. This could have been the end of the first temple period. Chizkel does a quick recovery, he does tshuva, and things fall apart again. But right here, Menashe destroys the temple. Right here, between Ashur, when Ashur falls, when Ashur, before Ashur falls, before Bethel comes in, that's pretty much the end of the first temple period. And Yoshiel here sees himself 
as the beginning of the second temple period. And here things start going good again. And the hope is we're going to go like this. Got it? That's the hope. And that's going to be Yirmiyah's opening message. And that's what's going to be Yoshio's great hope. Things will be so good that we're going to go to war against other superpowers. We'll see. We're going to be so sure that this is the beginning of our redemption. Okay, so let's go back now and read what happens in, in your meal. So let me stop the share now. Let me do a quick summary. Um, share my screen. And I'm sorry, I can go back to the other source sheet. So what do we have? Um, the years that precede your um, let me go to the bottom of my source sheet. Here. The years that precede, all the way at the end. I have a little table at the end. Here we are. Okay. Um, year 13 of Yoshiel. It's natural tshuva begins. We saw in Divar Yamim. Um, when he begins to tshuva, when he's young. In the meantime, Ashur falls. Year 18, we're going to read about now the renovation of the temple. And these are the great years of the Josiah reform. And things are going great. For some reason, Yoshiel is going to die tragically when he goes to war against Pharaoh, against Pharaoh Necho, and dies in Megiddo. Um, like 13 some years later, his son Yochim takes over and things go become a disaster. They leave God, and that's when all the trouble starts. And that's when Babel comes into power. That'll be our main topic for next week. But we have to understand today what's happening. Um, what's happening in the year 18 when they find the Sefer Torah? What's Yosho trying to do and how it relates to the Xardin from the time of Menashe? So let's read now from I'm sorry, we have to stay in the share. We have to go back. We're going to go back to Sefer Melachim now. And read the story of year 18, which is the key event in the time of, we'll go way back up. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, year 18. We're chapter 23 now in the book of Malachim. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I gave up. I skipped something. Right over here. My mistake. Year 18, chapter 22 in the book of um, Malachim. Okay. okay. Um, before we read from Divrei Amim, now we're going to read about Yoshiel from Divrei Malachim after Ammon was assassinated and they made Yoshiel king. So again, Ben Shmona Shana Yoshiel Bamacho, he was eight years and he reigned for 31 years. Now, Bayase Yashab Bene Hashem, and he went by the way of David Aviv. Yeah. In the 18th year of his reign, the King Yoshiel, he basically tells his, his people, his, um, his executives, go to the Beit HaMikdash, collect all the money that's been raised for renovating the temple, and start renovation of the temple. And there's a renovation project going on. In the middle of this renovation project, Chilkiel the Kohen, has something to tell Shafan the Sofer to tell the king. Listen carefully now to Pasachet. They find a Sefer Torah in, when renovating the temple. Now, a lot of people want to claim, in fact, the Bible groups make a big deal about this. They want to claim that the Sefer Torah, no one had a copy of the Torah, and and they want to say that's when they even the Bible critics say that that's when they sort of composed the Torah, at least they for the Varim here, which doesn't make any sense. We'll see why in a minute. They claim is they find a Torah in renovating the temple. Now, it could be there was no Torah ever. They didn't have a copy of it. So it was totally lost. Or the most more logical thing is they found the original. Why? Because when Menashe was destroying the temple and bringing all the idol worship, what did the Kohanim do? They took the original Sefer Torah and the Aron that was in the Kodesh Kodeshim, and they hid it, and they put it into Geniza. Because Menashe was defiling the temple and bringing all the idol worship in, because he was angry with God, the Kohanim put the Aron into Geniza, as well as the Sefer Torah that was with the Aron in the Kodesh Kodeshim, and they hid it. Now, in the middle of all the trouble happening in Yerushalayim under Menashe, it was lost. In renovating the temple, they found the original. It wasn't that no one had a copy of it. How could Yermio start learning. Remember when he was eight years old? Um, how could he start learning, or when he was 16 already, start learning Torah right, 10 years before this event? The, the, the people have the Torah. I give you a proof. Um, you can have a Sefer Torah in every, uh, uh, you know, Chumash, in everyone's home, and people don't know what's inside of it. 
Now, the fact that people don't know it doesn't mean it wasn't around. What they found here was the originals. They find the Dead Sea Scrolls. They, they found the original, which was a big event. And they shared this news with the king. Now, the king's going to use this finding of this um, Judaica, this great event, and turn it into something as a catalyst to get the, the tshuva a little bit better. I'll explain why in a minute. Let's read the story. He gives a whole report. In the middle of the report about renovating the temple, almost like as a sign point, Oh, by the way, look at this book we found. And Chilkiel read it in front of the king. Here's the words in there. He rips his clothing. It seems like Chazal was open to the Tochacha, which makes a lot of sense here. Okay. Go check what's happening. Okay. What's going to be with this? What's the meaning of all this? And they go to Chudah the Neviah. Why they go to Chudah? Not to Yirmiyahu. Chazal said Yirmiyahu was busy bringing the Ten Tribes back. We'll see why soon. But they go to Chudah the Neviah, and she's not so optimistic. What does she say? But Hashem Yisrael. Tell this message. Komar Hashem, and this sounds just like the Xardim from the Tema Menashe from several decades earlier. Terrible things are going to happen to this place. Because of all the bad things they did. You can read this later on your own. Okay. But tell the king of Yudah. Yan Rachlat, because your heart was soft and you became humble in front of God. And you did tshuva, you repented properly when you heard the words of, at this place about the thing. Okay. I heard your prayer. I'm not going to bring the destruction in your time. It won't happen during your lifetime. You won't see it with your own eyes. All the evil I'm going to do to your shalim. And they give the answer to the king. Now, the question is. What is insufficient about Yoshiel's tshuva? Now, what 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 Chod is telling the people? There's still a decree of destruction. The Xardin of Chorban is still there. God's still angry with the people, but Yoshiel's tshuva is enough to put it off for several decades, but not totally. In response to this, we'll see in a minute. Yoshiel doesn't say no. What's he going to do? They gather the whole nation together to the Beit HaMikdash. They read the Sefer Torah out, the whole Brit. That's just the bad start, but also the good part. The Brachot, Klalot, probably the Tochacha, probably all the laws of Sefer Devarim. They read it in public, and they stand in public. They make a new covenant with God. Right out of Sefer Devarim, right? Like It seems like they found a copy of Sefer Devarim, and in Pshat in Chumash, the Sefer Torah that's in the Kodesh Kodeshim is Sefer Devarim. And Sefer Devarim talks about the Tochacha. If you follow God, He'll bless you. If you don't follow, He'll punish you. And it seems like what Yoshea wants to do, He wants to undo the Gzardim from the time of Menashe. He wants to say that Menashe was the worst, that was bad. We deserve that decree of destruction. But now we're going to take upon ourselves to do better. And we're going to enter a new covenant with God. And Yoshiao's hope is to get rid of, to totally undo the Xardin of Chorban and begin the second temple period. And he's going to do that together with Yemriel. Now, um, later, they make a great Passover that year. And they say there was never Passover like that since the time of the Shoftim. In Deep Rahim, it's the time of Shmuel. Basically, this is one of the greatest Passovers ever. What Yoshiel is trying to do is to write, keep Shmuel say, Shana, Melech Yoshiel, Nasa Pesach, Azeh, Yerushalayim. In the 18th year of his reign, they make this grad Passover and um, they get rid of more. Any idol worship that was left over, they got rid of. And look how good he is. Who's ever king so good? I know I'm running out of time, so let me read the finish up quickly. But still, the Xardina of Menashe is still lingering over. 
And the question is going to be, will, will Yirmiyel with Yoshio be able to undo the Gzardin? Or is it a lost cause? Now, let me explain the key thing which we have to develop next week. What we have to understand is that on the one hand, there's a, a movement of repentance. And we're going to read in Yirmiyel, we'll see this next week, they're repenting to God, they're turning over a new leaf, but it's not enough. What are we going to find? Um, what I want to explain next week is that there's going to be a religious revival that's linked to a, a political revival or a nationalistic revival, meaning the reign of Yoshel coincides with the fall of the Assyrian Empire before the Babylonians come into power. There's a vacuum in the Middle East. Assur is falling apart. Yoshia has, has an opportunity to grow leaps and bounds. The country grows economically, geographically. We, it's a great time politically. And there's tons of nationalism during that time period. Together with that nationalism, we're returning to our God. We don't need Assyrian gods anymore. They're losers. We have our own God. And the people return to God, but it's not, we'll see in a minute, you're going to say it's not sincere. What's going to be the big test? They get rid of idol worship. They wipe out idol worship, but the society is going to remain corrupt. And what's Yimri going to talk about? We'll see this next week. He's going to say that it's not enough to re reestablish the temple. It's not enough to return to sacrifices to God. It's not to make the temple this great place. You have to fix your society. They're doing a decent job, but it's not enough. And God's demanding a much higher level of repentance to make things better. And we're going to see that the level that God's expecting, that your male is expecting from the people, is not enough. And the people are going to get super angry with God. Why? Because they think they deserve a much better um, um, judgment by God. Words, they're hoping that by rebuilding the temple and returning to sacrifices to God and getting rid of all the idol worship, that's sufficient to get rid of the, of the uh, decree of Menashe and the end of the first temple period. And God's got to say, that's not enough. I need a much better society. And the people aren't going to buy that message. And that's going to make things really complicated. Which Again, we'll have to do this next week properly. But this will be the background to understand why Yirmiyah is so misunderstood. And why the people are going to leave God again. In other words, the people are assuming God's going to be good to them because they rebuilt the temple and because they got rid of idol worship. And God isn't so good to them. Not as good as they were hoping. Especially once when Yoshio dies in battle, when they go to war against the Egyptians. That's going to get everyone angry with God again. They're going to start troubling other gods again. It'll get really complicated. And there's going to be a big argument between the people and his prophets about what is it that God wants from, from them to do. So let me stop here and look at the chat. And again, I'm leaving you pretty much open because we really didn't start Yermio yet. We have to read Yermio next week. This was a background to understand Yermio and uh, what's happening. So what's it called? Let's check real quick. Um, do you think times were lost forever? Would they come back? Um, we'll see. They do come back. In Yirmiyah, we're going to see the ten, so, not all the 10 tribes, but some of the tribes come back. In fact, Chazal say, and they have a good proof from, from Yirmiyah, that the reason why they go to Choldan, not Yirmiyah, is because they were um, Yirmiyah was busy bringing the 10 tribes back. Why could the 10 tribes come back after they were exiled by the Assyrians? When the Assyrian Empire falls apart, the people exiled have the ability to return. Not all of them return, but some of them do. And when they return, they return to Yudah, and then the whole nation becomes part of Yudah. The 10 tribes don't come back and become an independent kingdom anymore, but they come back and be part of Yudah, but Yudah expands all the way to the north. Remember, we saw they're, they're populating in front of Nashen. In archaeology, you have tons of, of um, findings and buildings and cities from the time of Yoshio. Okay, the diagram I shared with the source sheets. Um, okay. Oh, let me share. I'm going to share the... Uh, I'll send this. I sent the source sheet with the sources. It should be there. If not, I'll send it again. Um, um, okay. Okay. And when do I, okay. And any other questions? Okay. The three reasons why the temple, first temple was destroyed. Because I'll say in, um, in Mesechet Yoma, um, 11B, 11A or 9, either 9B oh, or 11. Is it plus, is it, it Daf Ted or Daf Yodal? It'll get mixed up now. 9B. 10, 9B, yeah. 9B. 9B, 9B and 10A. That's it. 9B. Um, why was the first temple destroyed? The main topic is Sinat Chinam. And the, the main topic of the Gemara is why Sinat Chinam, why um, Sinat Chinam is baseless hatred, which is always good reasons for. Why it's worse than the big three. 
What are the big three? Idol worship, arayot. I say arayot in English. Licentious behavior. Oh, immorality. Um, immorality, um, like incest and things like that. And um, idol worship. Idol worship, murder, and Im immoral behavior, or, or um, um, incest and things like that, called toy vote, abominations. That's the word in English. Um, those are all happening during the time of Menashe, and that's why God's bringing the destruction. When the temple is destroyed under Yemel, those reasons or most of them are gone. The people are much more religious when the first temple is destroyed. So not as bad as we're in time of Menashe. Um, but, the, um, but we'll see if that's going to be the background. And what we'll have to explain, again, we'll do this next week, is that in order to undo the decree, you need much more tshuva than the reason they got brought to the decree in the first place. In other words, if they were never as bad as Menashe, I wouldn't need to undo things. They wouldn't have to be so good uh, to stay around. But once there's already, once you're already um, under this decree of destruction, the amount of repentance you need to do has to be much higher level than um, than if it were just with an open with an open slate beforehand. So we'll see that later on. Um, in the summary verses about Josiah's reign, there's no mention of it promoting Mishpat and Sedek. Uh, okay, okay, we'll see that later on about what, what what's missing time of Yoshio. That's going to be Yermio's main message in a minute. That Yoshio is going to be. Um, they're so sure, basically, we're going to see next week, Yoshio is so sure that this is the beginning of redemption period, nothing can go wrong. They're sure that God's on their side, and God's, they're not doing good enough for God to be on their side. And, okay, and, uh, okay, yeah. So there's um, Sarah or Ilana. There's a famous Chazal that say when they were cleaning the people from idol worship, so they opened the door, and the house was clean of idol worship, but behind the door, they left the TV, so like I'm behind the uh, behind the bookshelf kind of idea. Um, again, that that's a way of saying. In a nutshell, we're going to see that the return to God, the tshuva, is from the top down. It's by the king, but the people aren't really there. The people are just happy to be. What we're going to see is, after suffering for decades under Assyrian rule, they're so happy to be free again and be sovereign again. The main thing is they're celebrating their sovereignty. That comes that with that nationalism comes a religious revival, but it's not a deep religious revival. It's 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 a superficial one. And their and the religion is more based on its expression of their nationalism more than their devotion to God. And that manifests itself in, in the society that they build. Okay. Now, if their success, Audrey asks, if their success never correlated with the goodness of the king, uh, oh, well, why would they think uh, now it, that's gonna be the big question? People assume that God blessing and cursing should be a function of our, of our rituals. Got it? Notice if we bring carbon and pray, things should go good. And then they're upset when they pray and God doesn't answer their prayers. The Nevim, which no one, no one bought them, are coming with this crazy idea that God doesn't care about sacrifices. It's okay to bring sacrifices, but the main thing, the sacrifice has to affect on how you behave. And God just judges you based on your behavior. That's a message that no one buys. What's that do with religion? And that's going to be Yermiel. That's going to be, I mean, Yeshayahu said the same thing, but that's the main message these later prophets are, are promoting and the people don't buy it. That was the, the, the answer to the lack of correlation is going to be the main message of the prophets because the people's assumption, the correlation should be between, the people are assuming that the correlation should be between prosperity and temple service and sacrifice and prayer. And the Vimer is saying the correlation between um, between a just society and it basically Isaiah screams it in the very beginning. Uh, but the people just don't buy that. Like nowadays people wouldn't buy a message like that. So um, but that's going to be the background. Um, okay. Um, okay. I'm going to share the diagram one more time. And let me get the, let me get the diagram up. Uh, Rabbi, right. do you have a copy yeah. of the diagram? You'll, you'll send me the, the I, diagram. I to, we'll we'll I, put I it on the website. Let, 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 let me just do it. I have it on my. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll do a. Um, give me a second. I'll answer questions. If you, everyone has a question about Peh, I can answer it. I'm going to just work on my computer for a second and share it to my. Wait, wait, I don't think I can share. Wait, can I share as host? Let me take a look in the chat. I, I think I can only share from my Google Drive. No. So I got to go. I can't do it from my computer. So but, let that's me the just, problem. Let me you go. should be able to share every. This. Like I can't share from my own computer. 
Oh, this I don't know. This I uh... yeah. Yeah, give me. I'm just gonna open up my Google Drive. I'll take a second. I'll have to open up my Google first. Although you you should be able to sh to share from your own computer. You, you want should... me to send you an email real fast? Is you sh you can share from your computer. I think so, but it's um yeah yeah I can. Let me, let me just let, okay. it'll take me a second. Okay. Let me drive. Um. Where are we? My drive. Okay. I'll upload. I gotta go to my computer. Source sheets, sine wave. There we go. Probably already there. Okay. Now I take it and I gotta do the, where is it? Sine wave. Why don't I see it? Sine wave. Um, that's not good. Okay, now I have to share it. Share. There we go. Share. Open for everybody. Copy link. Okay. And now I go back to you guys and do chat. Everyone. Okay. That should do it. Someone open and make sure it works. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, got it? Got yeah, it. it works. It works. All thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, okay, Rabbi. Everyone have a good week. And um, we'll see you next week. We'll get back to uh, next week. Things will make a lot more sense. Today, we just had to get the introduction to the background. And next week, we'll see your meow and sign if we can start reading. All right. And you'll, you'll send me the link just by email so I can put it on the website. I think that's okay. easier than yeah, okay. from here. Send it okay. Again. No okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Shavuot. I'm ready to move okay. real fast. So you'll, you'll close, you'll close up, Rabbi? Yeah, I'll close up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm the host anyway. So yeah, I'll close up. Yeah, yeah. You go. Okay. All right. Uh, everybody's well. Hope everybody's well, actually our next year is on Tuesday. No class tomorrow, uh, unusually, but, uh, Tova Ganzel will be at 12 noon uh, Eastern time, continuing her wonderful series. And then Marty Lection on Wednesday, Shuli Mishkin and our Parsha Shear on, on Thursday. Uh, this week, the Parsha Shear is given by Rabbi Dan Daniel Fridman of the of Teaneck Jewish Center. And, and then my Shear on Friday on the Sitter. And uh, we look forward to learning with you. And uh, like we, I said in the beginning, it's the summer. I know people, I, I think, should have more time for learning in the summer. And lots of, uh, hopefully, I don't know if people are, are traveling or doing well, but I, I, everybody should be well and uh, enjoy. Is and, Tova uh, Ganzel's last class recorded? It sure should have been. Why, is it not up on the website? I, I don't see the YouTube. All right, you know, so thank you. I will check right away with our, our tech guy, David, David Callender, who's been doing our tech for, for 20 years since the Torah Motion got started you know, 20 years ago, he's been Thank doing, you. we had all our live programs. Thank you for that. But um, okay. All right. We look forward to seeing everybody and everybody have a beautiful week and uh, all the best. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.